Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Anurag and welcome to my channel. So today in this video, uh, I have brought in someone who's going to answer all your neurology related questions. All right, so a little bit of introduction about who he is. Well, he likes to call himself the brain nerd. He's an eccentric vlogger and a Kathmandu Medical College grad. Currently training to be a neurologist in Wayne State University neurology program in Detroit, Michigan, the neurologist extraordinaire himself, Dr. Sashwat Singh Pokhrel. Welcome, Dr. Sashwat. Thank you, Anurag. That was a that was a really uh, that was some description. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, Dr. Sashwat, so uh, today you're going to answer some questions about neurology and tell us about what the specialty is like, right? I mean, from a neurologist himself. Um, yeah, uh, sure. I mean, I'm still not a neurologist yet, technically speaking. I'm still in training. So, uh, yeah, but uh, any questions that uh, there are, obviously, I'm here to answer as much as I can. I uh, hope I'll do much justice to it. A little bit of a curveball, but how's Michigan like? I mean, how's uh, the weather there and how, how uh, good do you think you are adapting to Michigan? Okay, depends on when you're asking. Like right now it's summer, so it's brilliant. Everything's nice, warm, sunny, but like winters are harsh. But, you know, I like changes of season. It's not boring. Like you have to like adapt. Uh, I guess that just makes you stronger. But I, I love uh, I love how it is outside. Uh, I live in Midtown and it's pretty nice to go around on walks. Uh, it's, a, it's a clean and nice city, not like uh, what you have a perception of Detroit. It's not like that. You just have to avoid the wrong places. Uh, it's a nice city and it's a nice state, uh, um, you know, just by, the, uh, by one of the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, and it's kind of windy sometimes. Uh, weather is unpredictable, but like it's mostly pleasant. And winters are also not that harsh if you compare it to like Canada or like, you know, upper, upper American states. So uh, I will say I can't complain. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of happy. Yeah. Uh, that sounds nice. Dr. So uh, let's get into the video right now. So uh, let's start with a little bit into your step exam journey and match year. So how, how did it all start and, you know, uh, how did it start rolling? So something into that. Yeah. So, um, uh, like everyone, I, uh, you know, I was like uh, busy during my intern year. And then like afterwards, I worked for eight months, uh, approximately in the teaching hospital. I worked in the emergency department. So it was like a full time job and, uh, you know, uh, six to sometimes eight hours, dep depending on the handover, uh, what we used to go uh, for sign outs. And uh, so it, it was a tough job. So didn't get time to study. So I actually postponed my preparation uh, eight months later and um, started, uh, I graduated in 2016. Uh, so I, but I started my preparation like somewhere in the middle of 2019, uh, 2017. So, um, and then for step one, I took almost a year because, you know, I wish I was faster um, now looking back into it, but then I took my time with it. Uh, I took like almost a year or even more uh, just to prepare for step one. And then, um, yeah, I actually eventually completed it one day. And uh, obviously for step two CK, I took like about, I'd say five months, five to six months, not, mu not much more uh, than that. Uh, and later than, you know, when I was doing my step to CK, then I was planning on coming to the US and like planning the other steps. And I was one of the last batches to uh, be able to give CS. So was preparing for CS and like all my travel plans and simultaneously also studying for step to CK. And uh, I was doing some part-time job at the time as well. Um, I mean, like I wasn't like completely off, uh, but I just uh, took an easy job. So I would just get some side money and then, you know, would also get enough time to study. So um, yeah, step two happened. And then uh, do you want me to go over my other steps or did you just wanted to talk about this? Uh, just an overview and uh, in which year did you get into the residency program? Oh, okay. So I matched uh, in 2020, uh, the most, you know, the notorious year that you all know. <laughs> <laughs> with all the 
contagion happening in real life. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I matched in 2020. So I started my preparation in 2017. So it took me about like uh, um, three years approximately. So I was like a three-year-old graduate by the time when I matched. So uh, that was my first match. Uh, it wasn't my second match. Um, and uh, yeah, so I gave my CS. Uh, uh, it wasn't like most people from Nepal, they usually prefer to give it in Texas, but I was kind of, I don't know, looking back, I would say gutsy. I actually attempted to give it in Chicago because we don't have an organized hotel where everyone stays and like it's it's very hard to practice, especially with a few people walking around. But I did meet a lot of uh, Indian and Pakistani people who became like lifelong friends, fortunately, and there was a place called Forest Park Library uh, that's in... Uh, you know, just uh, south of downtown and uh, downtown Chicago. So I practiced there, went there daily um, from a bus and then, yeah, finished it, gave my exam and like uh, returned back to where I was staying at my relative's place. And, you know, I uh, fortunately passed. And after that, like preparation, um, writing my CV, you know, designing my CV and my personal statements, getting all the LORs, you know, rushing up with all the observerships that I actually got lucky to get, uh, and finally applied. And, uh, and fortunately, I matched uh, in 2020. <laughs> After that, the story is like, there's still a story behind that, but then, yeah, let's leave it for some other day. Uh, but that's great, Dr. Sastra. So, I mean, uh, 2020, right? What an amazing year. I mean, in case right. of matching, but, uh, you know, COVID, atrocities, everything. So, okay, apart from that, so now, you know, like, so what uh, is a day in the life of uh, someone who is training to be a neurologist like? I mean, uh, a brief about what you do and, you know, how is the, uh, how are the things that go on in your life after you wake up and then, you know, do everything and then go back to bed. So what's it like? Yeah, I mean, uh, nice question. I mean, uh, it, it's almost like a day of a typical resident uh, to sum it up. Uh, I'll just like start from saying that neurology is a four year uh, program, uh, but the first year is mostly internal medicine. So it might be like various, uh, they might, the, the nomenclature may, might be like uh, different, like there might be advanced programs or categorical, uh, we'll come to that later. But then anyway, the first year is mostly internal medicine and you will only have uh, uh, a few months of neurology, uh, but not like, not wholesome. Uh, and yeah, we are almost, uh, almost the same as first year internal medicine residents. And we do night floats, we do the uh, in, uh, internal medicine floors, and a few months of ICU. So we complete everything that's required per ACGME, uh, you know, criteria. Uh, but obviously one or two rotation uh, year and there might be different uh, based on the program you're in. So in my program, uh, I rotated in like almost uh, most of the uh, important internal medicine specialties as well. Uh, but the floor duties and night floats, they were more, um, those are more of a learning experience that was fruitful for me. So my day goes like this. Uh, uh, so because I'm in a transitional kind of program, like it's, it's not my own program right now, I'm, I'm rotating with IM. Uh, the, ro the rotation is kind of erratic, I'd say, on a month to, uh, month, -to month basis. So it's like I wake up usually most common rotations require you to wake up early. So it depends where you chart the patient. So charting means like, you know, just looking at the information, their daily progress. And like, uh, uh, so sometimes if uh, the rounds start very late, then I actually uh, open up my computer, uh, chart the patients here, I write down the inf important informations uh, at home. And then I go, I, I, I live like 12 minutes away from the hospital, so I walk. Uh, I walk in the morning, I go there and then like see all the patients and note all the changes, uh, talk to the nurses, see what happened overnight and and then like prepare for the rounds. Uh, if there's a fellow in the program, then I usually round with the fellow. Otherwise, it's uh, mostly the internal medicine residents, the seniors, and I pre-round with them so that we prepare for the presentation uh, with the attending. And then we round with the attending and the uh, we see the patient make some changes, order things, wrap things up, discharge the ones that are going to be discharged. And then 
depending on the program i'm sometimes back home by like 2 p.m if you know it's not that busy but usually on average i'd say i'm back at like 4 p.m 5 p.m but if i have night floats then my day schedule my circadian rhythm kind of flips over so i have to wake up at night and then uh, you know work the nights for 12 hours and come back again uh, in the morning after the rounds so um, that's that's like the typical schedule that i have and obviously there are uh, electives uh, electives are much more funner because it's not a very tight schedule it's like what you choose uh, you know to rotate so it's like an optional thing that people you know different people have different electives um, so those are fun because they're not like you know full time they're just like kind of kind of part time and uh, you come home early you get things done and it's uh, you know you have a life when you're on electives so it's much more fun i'd say but obviously that's not always the case you get there are busy hours as well so that's like my typical day and then i come home and like just chill um and uh, you know the all the reading that's that needs to be done well in my case i usually try to read whatever's pertinent in on the floors so that like i i don't have to you know dedicate uh, a time um at home just to read um that i will probably do it next year because uh, for the first year neurology uh, residents we don't have board exams so it's just rotations uh but from next year in my uh, the second year pgy2 i'll have board exams so i will need to study uh, and be more dedicated so right now that's my daily schedule and i call home every day at night and that's also important <laughs> yeah there was a really nice touch there at the end where you said that you call home every day you know because that's important yeah, every day yeah no, i except- mean uh, you you're, you're living a lot you know a great distance away from home and it's really difficult to keep track of things sometimes right Right. <laughs> and uh, the thing that you mentioned about circadian rhythm, you know, I mean, uh, I think that should, I have not looked into this, but I think there should be a study regarding circadian rhythm among doctors, you know, because uh, our circadian rhythm is, is like you said, right? <laughs> it, 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 it uh, you know, I mean, it gets uh, bashed a lot because, you know, there are night floors and you have to stay alert all the time. Uh, I mean, yeah, so I'll look into that after this video, whether there's a research on that or not, but it's a pretty Yeah, sure. I mean, there, there are plenty. You'll find plenty, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, Adolf Sashwat. So moving on, uh, we will get into what mm-hmm. I mean, neurology is like, but what neurology isn't then? Okay. Um, well, I also like said the same thing uh, in one of... Uh, uh, one talk I had earlier. It's not boring, okay? <laughs> That's the first thing that isn't. It's not boring, at least for me it isn't. That's why I went into it. Uh, uh, what it isn't is, um, so it is It, it is not uh, uh, I am specialty, at least in the US. So it, it is definitely, most part of neurology is still intimately tied to general medicine. But it's uh, unlike in Nepal or uh, most South Asian countries, it's not like a, a sub super specialty if, uh, we go into from medicine. So it's like a different residency program in, it, in its own self, as you already know. Uh, what it's not, another point I would say is, uh, so it's, it's not easy, okay? It's not also easy. It's like a four year program, so it's a commitment. So I would say like, unless you're super interested into it or you have already thought about what fellowships you're going to go into, uh, then you shouldn't uh, just become a neurologist just to, you know, just to um, get that residency out of the way. So you, I, I'd say, I would suggest that you need to think deeply uh, if you want to become a neurologist because it's a commitment because you can't go into cardio later on. So you've already like kind of narrowed down your um, goals. So you need to think carefully. And other thing what it's not, I would say, is uh, the fellowship options are not limited. So given that you've all, you're already interested in the brain and everything regarding the brain diseases, uh, there are, you know, there are a lot of like uh, fellowship opportunities right now. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's limited. And the good thing about neurology is that even if you don't do a fellowship, you're still a specialist. So you'll get to work as a specialist. And that's like the greatest perk uh, that this field offers. Um, And yeah, I mean, like personally, I would say it's not, you know, adding to the statement that I said, 
the premise that it's not boring is because it's it's also frontier science okay a lot of things we're we're uh, i wouldn't say scratching the surface but we still have a lot to know about the human brain you know how it functions and uh increasingly we are also treating more mind related problems from a neurological perspective because like if you know something about the inflammation theory of uh, psychological problems it's more and more more and more data are showing that it's because of inflammatory changes in the brain that we experience depression and all these mental disorders and it's just not enough to treat them with ssri and things like that so given the blurred distinction between psychiatry and neurology and like uh, an approach that exists in the us is like they they tackle this issue they treat mental health i mean you know um, brain related diseases uh in the sense that they're working as a neuroscience department so it's you'll find yourself working with neurosurgeons a pediatric neurologist and also like you know uh cognitive uh, psychologists uh, psychiatrists everyone so it's it's more like a holistic approach now they nowadays and that's also like interesting so it's not like just you will be just you know uh tapping people's knee and like just doing limited to knee reflexes it's like much broad so i'd say it's not boring that's 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 what i meant by that definitely not boring according to your description and yeah I, i i too you know like enjoyed a lot while i was reading um neuro i mean topics uh, during my step one preparation and step two preparation because um you know we tend to look at diseases in a gross fashion but when you dive deep into the neurons and the uh, biochemical theories and everything i think it's pretty interesting right to right. and to be right. in that frontier science where things are changing constantly and new things are being discovered i think that must be pretty thrilling uh, all in right. all right, right. <laughs> okay yeah, so you make fun of neurologists here i mean like in a friendly <laughs> kind of professional way saying like neurologists notes are like very detailed and like even though i haven't like become a proper neurology resident right now uh, my i am colleagues like used to uh, make fun of us saying like oh you're a neurologist that's why your notes are like so detailed and <laughs> so yeah that's that's the stereotype associated with it and yeah i mean we are kind of investigational it's mostly a consult based service so yeah yes definitely i mean um if you're working with something that's as complicated as the brain i mean you need to be sharp you need to be inquisitive you need to be on point all the time right so yeah i think that's a really good description of what you said i mean regarding neurologists so uh, so you mentioned that uh, it's not like uh, i mean uh, in the south asian countries like ours where uh, you first do an internal medicine for 3 years and then you go in super specialty and then you go into neurology right i mean it's not like that but it's a separate entity all in all um, and it focuses on all these uh, neurocognitive things and it's a diverse team of people who are in under i mean Uh, in play and everything is there right so i think that was a pretty good distinction that happens uh, i mean that is uh, that i wanted to know because like you mentioned you know it's for three years here and then but there it's like a separate entity and that i i was actually not able to wrap my head around this fact that okay now why why is it functioning that way but i think you made it clear uh so uh prospects after residency i mean there's uh always an end goal right where do you want to be so uh what would you say are the prospects after residency i mean what's it going to be like after these four years of neurology um so uh, like i said a lot of uh, you know um there are a lot of fellowship opportunities uh, but you don't necessarily have to do a fellowship you can just become a general neurologist and you're still a specialist okay i mean like you're not a you won't be a primary care physician okay you're not going to be someone's primary care physician so primary care is in the us it's something like what the gp is in the uk so they patients first approach their primary care and then they refer them to specialists and that's how systems work here uh so we as neurologists we won't be a primary uh, care physician most of the time uh even if we become a neuro hospitalist even if we see inpatient neurology patients we we only take in uh the patients that are like pure neurological cases like autoimmune neurology or like something like multiple sclerosis um you know pure stroke like if there's uh, you know not many medical conditions or so that are like more important so we, we take few in patients as well but most of the time we're doing a hospital consult round so other other services they consult our department and then we go and see the patients and make recommendations so that's mostly what if you don't do a fellowship that's what your life is mostly going to be and obviously i forgot about 
I didn't talk about clinics. It's mostly clinics as well. So clinics is also very important in neurology. But these days, as the field has progressed, you don't necessarily have to do clinics. Uh, most of my colleagues, most of my friends, they're bored of clinic. They don't want to do clinics. So they, most of them like inpatient. But um, I haven't discovered uh, fully for myself yet, so can't say much. Uh, but yeah, some people, they only like clinics and they just choose to do, do that. So even if you don't do a fellowship, you can choose where you can go. Um, now the question is about fellowship, okay? Uh, and before that, um, I think an important thing for IMGs at least would be the question of visas and their immigration status, right? So it depends on what visa you're on. So uh, for me, I'm on a J1 visa. So most, most neurology programs, like um, there are like 166 programs, uh, at least it was 166 when I applied. So that's the total number of neurology programs um, that, there are, that there are in the US. So out of the 166, I, I would only say like there, are, you can count those in like uh, in one hand, those which offer H1B uh, uh, you know, visas, very rare. It's rare anyway, but for neurology, it's even rarer. So only a few programs offer H1B for uh, international graduates. So most are J1. So the issue is like, if you're on a J1, so you have to make a decision whether you, are, you want to go into a fellowship. Uh, it's easier to get into a fellowship if you're on a J1. Uh, but if you're on H1B, then you might just want to work and become a hospitalist or a general neurologist and might like uh, do a fellowship later once you get a green card because you'll have like, greater options. It's just that uh, uh, you won't be a fresh resident, but you know, in neurology, that doesn't matter that much because there are only a few programs like stroke, neuro ICU, and some programs are only matched. Rest are like just uh, on a contact basis. So uh, it's not that like rigid. So it's kind of, I, I'd say the most, one of the most flexible specialties. And like I said, if you want on a J1 visa, uh, you'll easily get a fellowship, but you still have to do a three year of waiver uh, program. That means like you need to apply, get approved and work on a, now you need to change your visa to H1B and work for three years. So it's like something like a bond that uh, people who study in IOM and BPKH just have in Nepal. So it's, it's something like that bond. And unless you complete that bond, you won't be eligible for a green card or anything. So that's the limitation of J1 and you need to make your decision based on that. But if you have an H1B, I think it's much more easier to get a fellowship in neurology because, you know, as I said, most neurology programs are uh, contact based uh, fellowships. I mean, and uh, if you have a H1B, then it's more likely that you might get into it. Uh, and yeah, obviously if you are a green card holder, it's much more easier. So all those things come into play when you're making a decision, but yeah, the options are plenty. Mm -hmm. So a four years residency program, right? So now let's get into a few things. Let's say, you know, in short about what neurology actually is according to you. Okay. <laughs> so like you said, it's a separate entity, but then, uh, so it's a, it's a, I would say the field of neurology as a distinct uh, body in medicine kind of emerged around the late 60s and like early 70s so that's when like uh, so that's like the typical time when famous physicians neurologists like oliver sacks they also practiced and that's when this field kind of grew into it and became its own entity in itself so what it is i would say is uh, so it's a branch of neuroscience so obviously like i said you have to work with different specialties in neuroscience psychiatry neurosurgery uh, all those um and it's a four-year program, uh, but the, the pure neurology training you get is like mostly for the the uh, mostly for three years, because the first is uh, you know intra medicine mostly, and the second year is the busiest for neurologists. So that's when we become a uh, a senior, uh, but a junior you know a junior in neurology, but a senior overall because. We'll be senior to the interns, but junior to the other seniors. So we'll be, we'll be doing the most work, PGY2s. Uh, and our third year is, you know, mostly we'll still be working the same as PGY2s, but probably we will be writing less notes. And in the fourth year is mostly an elective year in most neurology programs in the US. So that means like we, they will send us more on electives, but we will do the calls, obviously, calls and our clinics that will still be there. 
but our rotations are a little bit relaxed because apart from the calls and uh, the clinics, we will mostly be on electives. So we'll be rounding on a little bit eased off kind of rotations. Uh, but obviously it's not, it's not easy, but it gets lighter because you will also get more used to the work. Uh, what it is, I would say is, uh, it's not hard to get in. Like, uh, you know, most people, they don't try to apply to neurology because maybe they're not interested, maybe they don't know. So I think that's the two reason why people don't apply. But it's not hard to get in as long as you focus your CV and all those things. You know, if you, if you really want, and if you really do, uh, do, you know, design your CV or like your application, I'd say, and and show your interest, then it's not it's not hard. The match rates for uh, neurology and uh, internal medicine are almost similar. If you look at the latest NRMB data, that's like that happens every year. And but the thing is. It's getting more competitive every year. More and more people are realizing the benefits this specialty offers. And uh, more and more people are also interested about the human brain. Uh, so the number of applicants are increasing and it's getting more competitive. So I would say that's what it is, but there are, there's more obviously. I, I didn't do it much justice. There's, it's a, it's a non-exhaustive uh, list, you know. So I can go on, but like, let's just cut it here. Definitely. I mean, uh, when you put it, it sounds so simple, but like you mentioned, there are a lot of aspects behind it and there's a lot of things that you need to uh, build your CV, right? So I came across this uh, topic in one of these forums and uh, with a lot of people whom I've talked who've matched into the US, they say that your CV actually needs to be catered, right? So it needs to be uh, prepared. It needs to be designed. I mean, uh, with all the experiences that you have, I mean, it needs to point to a certain passion of yours, certain specialty of yours, right? I mean, um, like we can't make it in that way, but if you're interested, it shows, right? So right. what would you say uh, would a CV that is uh, neurology focused uh, might include? So a tip oh, okay. for some people who want to apply was probably, so I think, uh, uh, maybe the applications will increase this year because of this video as well. <laughs> Who knows? So uh, for those candidates who think they're going to apply to neurology, uh, what would be your two cents about the CV, uh, personal statement, all those behind the scenes apart from scores? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, so, um, uh, so like you said, uh, tailoring your CV, it doesn't mean only the CV. So I would say tailoring your application. I think that's a better word because it's not just about your CV, it's like overall. So, so it's, it's, it's mostly like what they say in marketing. Okay, so like I, if you read books on marketing, I think that that way you'll understand the philosophy. The philosophy here is uh, uh, you need to sell yourself, okay? Uh, but you can sell yourself if you're genuinely and you're truly interested, it's going to be easier for you, okay? So someone who's not interested and someone who is interested, uh, if both of them need to sell you something, uh, who's going to sell that thing better to you? Some obviously someone who's interested, right? So I mean, it, it definitely helps if uh, if you're interested, but it's also okay if you're undecided and like you're still exploring your options. You don't have to like you know be discouraged. I think it's doable. Um, and you know, a lot of my seniors are like they weren't interested in the field, but they actually got really um, they enjoyed the field as they got into it. So you know, that might be a way for someone to discover. So I would say uh, your CV is obviously the main backbone of your application. So I wouldn't say scores. A lot of people would say scores, uh, but I, 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 would, I would just consider the scores to be like one dimension. Um, I don't know if you guys have played FIFA, but like there's this, every player uh, has, you know, a, a dimension. So it's, it's more like a rhomboid kind of thing. Someone's skills, pace, everything is like kind of tied up, you know. Uh, so it turns out to become this rhomboid kind of, uh, sorry for that, uh, uh, gra uh, you know, diagram. So it's something like that. So there's like a scores here, there's like your CV, there's your personality and like there, there are your US clinical experiences. So some, some parts might be like too edgy and like some part might not be. It's just the thing is you need to kind of compensate for something that you don't have with some other attributes that you might be good at. So for me uh, personally, I was good at like uh, uh, speaking, you know, I, I could speak, that wasn't an issue for me. And I could write, 
uh, I'm like, I'm, uh, I'm good at writing. So I could like uh, personal statements, uh, you know, th these things were not like very hard for me to do. Uh, I would say I had like average scores uh, in the 240s. So, um, uh, but that's considered good for neurology. So it's also like your scores are relative depending on what field you're going into. Obviously, if it's like a super competitive field, like, uh, you know, radiology or surgery, then probably I would have aimed for like a higher scores. But I knew from my final year that I was going to neurology. So um, scores weren't that important from my perspective. But obviously, I'm not saying that you can get away with like low scores. Obviously, if you have a really good score, then you will have a chance of matching into a very good neurology program too. So you have to take that into effect. Uh, obviously, try to get good scores. I never say get low scores, but you know, that's always there. But that's not, you know, if you have, if you didn't get like desired scores, that's not the end of the story. So you, there's your CV. You know, you might be someone who didn't get a good score, but you might have tons of extracurricular activities. You might have gone on to like do 50, 60 health camps, you know, uh, after you graduated. All those things are going to work in your benefit. And, uh, you know, people talk about how year of graduation kind of hinders your chances. That's, that's, uh, that's a myth, I would say. Um, don't listen to that. A year of graduation is relevant. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, it hinders your application. If the, if there is a, like a huge gap, like you didn't do anything or you, you were like completely um, off practice for like five years, then that kind of uh, hurts your chances. But if you've been doing something meaningful, let's say you were working in as a medical officer in a neurology hospital, like in Basbari, uh, the neurology hospital in Basbari, if you're like, doing any, uh, you know, relevant work, then that counts. Your experience helps even in residency here. So, um, uh, you know, so you'll have, you'll be more confident, more mature. So that's what they're looking for too. It's, they're not only looking for fresh graduates because I had like a couple of friends who are like very fresh graduates, you know, they're also applying for neurology and uh, uh, really good scores, really good CV, lots of US experience. Uh, still didn't get in. Um, you know, it's it's unlucky. I wouldn't say it's their fault, but it's so that like even they themselves tell me that they learned that they were looking for more experience, and that's probably what they didn't get to tell them. So experience also counts, and that year of graduation is a myth in a sense that you need to do something mean, meaningful, and that adds to your CV too. So your personality, and then like your ability to write, or like you might be a great musician, you need to like you know, highlight that aspect. You might be a poet, you need to highlight that aspect as well. So you need to just say that you're a very interesting person and you're deeply interested into this field, um, in this case, neurology. But obviously this strategy is like not unique to neurology. It's like, if, if you adopt this strategy, you can actually match into any any program of your choice. But obviously it's, it's not, um, you know, you, a correction of your dimensions that's not just enough. Obviously, you also have to put in the effort. And without that, you know, uh, if you got all of the uh, those things in, then I think it's possible. And that's basically how you apply and match into neurology. That was insightful, Dr. Sashwat. So uh, in times of COVID, right, contagion happening in real life, like you mentioned. Right. So <laughs> uh, a lot of people have not been able to uh, get visas for travel and observerships. Right. And, uh, you know, those things that... Uh, set you apart, right? I mean, United States mm -hmm. clinical experience, because obviously I too believe that, uh, I mean, program directors and everyone who's going to take you in, they want to see whether you can adapt to the US system or not, whether you know things about the system or not. I mean, it's, it's a normal thing, right? I mean, so right. in times of COVID, what, what do you think uh, candidates can do to improve their chances of, uh, I mean, uh, getting, um, into the specialty and how can they improve their candidacy if they've not uh, received a travel visa or let's say they can't make it to the United States for observerships. Mm -hmm. So how would you say we can uh, candidates utilize their time back at home? All right, that's a, that's a very good question and pertinent as well, uh, you know, because of the pandemic. So, uh, uh, you know, lots of juniors from my college or like other med schools, you know, uh, people who know me through contacts, uh, they have, they did approach uh, me with the, this problem and like I got to like analyze 
most people's problem and uh, come to a common ground and a conclusion. Um, and, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that this happened. Obviously, it's better if you, uh, you know, uh, get to do U.S. clinical experience. But the thing is, um, I would say, I mean, like to be just to be realistic, it's unfortunate, but uh, the chances are a little bit higher for someone who did their clinical experience than someone who did not, uh, I mean, in the U.S., so that's that's just logical okay but but the thing is you just don't have to uh, you know be discouraged again it's it's a matter of trying obviously there's a lot of money involved and i understand why like uh, it's just not enough for everyone and that's understandable uh, but the thing is uh, uh, but the thing is if if by any means you cannot like uh, uh, come to the us and your US clinical experience got canceled or like you just simply cannot come because there's no flights uh, and your, your, the embassy in your country is like just shut down. Um, that has happened to people. If that happens, I would suggest just work on what you have, all right? Because that's, I mean, these are the things we cannot control, um, unfortunately. And like, I would say just work on the things that you can control. Um, the things you can control is you can, you can increase the number of publications you have definitely that's something you can do you you can like work in a neurology related field that's also something you might be able to you know get i i wouldn't say like everyone would get a neurology related job but like even if you can get a job in psychiatry like i said it's it's a holistic approach here so even if you get a job in neurosurgery that's fine it has to be about the brain and the mind as long as it's you know fulfills the criteria it's fine now um, and you, you don't even have to work in, a, in these fields. You can also work in geriatrics because they see a lot of dementia patients, stroke patients, right? You can, you can work in rehabilitation, physical medicine and rehabilitation, physiotherapy, because most part of neurology, um, the field itself involves, you know, physical therapy. That's like a huge chunk of our, uh, you know, management program. So these are like, there are a lot of specialties scattered around, even in like, Nepal or like wherever you're from, South Asia, you know. So it doesn't only have to be like in a neurology department. Like it doesn't have to be that black and white. You just, you can like grab any opportunity you can. You can also like work in internal medicine. You can still see stroke patients, there, all right? But like just, just write case reports. I would say like, you know, all the, any neurology related cases you see, just write case reports. It doesn't even have to be a published case report. It can be a poster presentation. Just do whatever you can with whatever you have. Just make the most out of it. I think that would be the best thing. So, you know, if, if things work in your favor, if you get like a, uh, if you get this uh, opportunity, you can always come to the US. And if you do a clinical experience, all those things are going to be a, a plus for you. So, you know, work with what you have is what I would say to them. Okay, uh, right. so I had a quick question about your background. So is, is, it, is it from uh, Droid itself or I mean? Uh, oh, this background? Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so this is, a, this is a background, like it's a Zoom background provided by my, uh, the university that I am in. It's uh, Wayne State University. So it's, uh, they, they use it for most of their other faculties and other programs as well. Uh, so it's, it's actually, there is a street, uh, I think it's in downtown or midtown. I don't know the exact place. I think that's from here. So a lot of artists, they do street painting here. Like it's a creative kind of, uh, uh, so Detroit is in a art and culture resurgence. So it's part of that. So you get to see a lot of unique and, uh, you know, interesting things around Detroit if you, if you get, if you walk. Uh, so this is like one of those projects the university students had, and it's pretty interesting. <laughs> Yes, and uh, Detroit actually is an artistic scene. I mean, it has been for quite yeah. a while now. Uh, music and art and culture, everything is there. So right, right. I mean, <laughs> uh, so there's like a Detroit is kind of. Uh, uh, it's not just like only a pioneer for car. So even if you look for, um, if you listen to soul music, uh, you know, exactly R and B, uh, uh, you know, hip hop and everything. Most of those uh, seminal works of uh, musical um pieces they actually originated in detroit so if you're into that then definitely this is like a this will be like a historical trip to you and art and culture yes a lot uh, you know it's in its 
second renaissance that's what everyone in the detroiters they say that and i just like picked up from them so they're saying they're in the second renaissance covid kind of halted uh, progress a bit but then it's back up again so it's uh, you know uh, detroit is back that's what they're saying so it's a, it's a nice place to have lots of food options uh, you can dine out every day and you don't you don't run out of options so that's also if you're you're into food so yeah it's it's an interesting place to be indeed uh, so uh, like you mentioned right so uh, connections are important right i mean you first of all you build i mean your scores you get amazing scores try to get amazing scores you know you right. uh, show your love for the specialty because i mean if you love a specialty then i believe just like you mentioned you'll find ways to uh, work anywhere and make the most out of any situation right so apart from that uh, it's really difficult to connect with people, right? I mean, um, mm. like with this YouTube channel, what I get to do is I get to talk to people like you and, you know, uh, right. connect to people in some way. So uh, mm. what would you suggest? I mean, how would you suggest uh, someone who's interested in neurology can reach mm. out to people in the specialty in this field? You know, so is there, is, is there a way or, I mean, how would you suggest someone goes about connecting with other people in the specialty so that they can get a better idea about what they're getting into or what the prospect is going to be like? And uh, remotely, if anything help is possible, then how can they, uh, you know, get all of those things? Uh, so is there a way to do it? Or, I mean, is there any tips? Are there, are there any tips that you would like to uh, offer yeah, I mean to new candidates? Exactly. Uh, another really good question. So important as well, because that's like where the difference is. Uh, you know, human beings, we are social animals, all right? We evolved this way. I mean, like we didn't evolve as individuals because uh, we survive as a group. So definitely connections are like just professional socializing, I would say. So, um, you know, it might be intimidating to approach people like, you know, you don't know them. Um, you might feel uh, uh, awkward approaching them. But I would say just try, you know, just try. I mean, if, if they're approachable people, they will respond. I mean, I do respond to a lot of people. I mean, obviously, I don't get around to being in contact with everyone because, you know, as a human being myself, I'm also limited. I have like work and stuff. That's the same for other people, too. And you need to have this uh, in your mindset when you're approaching people. Uh, they might not reply and that's OK. But like, you know, just try, they might, you know, if they do reply and they respond to you, um, you hit a jackpot or like, you know, you hit a, you, you might also hit a soft spot to them. Uh, that's one way. Another way is obviously hearsay and like people, you know, uh, if you have someone, you know, in the field best, now uh, I think they will be the best people to help you. Uh, uh, and obviously someone, you know, who knows someone and someone they know. All right. That's also again, how it goes. And uh, uh, another, another thing is word of mouth. Uh, I mean, this is what I meant. Word of mouth is, I think, the strongest link towards people. Uh, and that's the most traditional way, all right? And uh, uh, if you want to be um, use the more modern means, then I would say social media, all right? So social media, I think the most effective ones, uh, email, obviously, but they might not always reply to your emails. Two reasons. One, they don't know who you are. Um, they, you might be phishing them. You might be a spam. So they don't know who you are. That's one reason why people don't, uh, professional people, they don't reply. Another reason is because most people, if you approach their uh, institutional emails, uh, how the system is, is that uh, our emails, if you, if you email them from a Gmail, it comes up as an external email uh, all right, in the system. So it will be marked as an external email. And those sometimes can be ignored by most people or by the system and your e email might be filtered out. So that's one reason why people might not receive your email and you don't have to be disheartened if someone don't reply, you know, so that's, that's one possibility. Another, they might just not simply reply because they don't know you. Another, uh, they might have like just missed your email because they get like, we get tons of email every day. So you might, it might have been missed. So you need to realize that too. But email, obviously, if someone recommends us a, a professional or a person to you, um, then definitely emails are the best way to make first contact. And after that, they might give you their various means of contacting. 
uh, they might be comfortable with phone. I mean, that comes after the first contact. So emails are the most common point of first contact. Uh, next is social media, like Twitter and LinkedIn, best. Uh, because it's, it's considered a good etiquette if you approach people from Twitter uh, or LinkedIn because it's considered professional as well. And people like it. They don't mind being contacted on those platforms. Um, uh, if you can't, uh, so the difference is the, why it's different on Facebook or Instagram. People might not like it because most people use Facebook and Instagram in a private way. So they don't like you approaching them, you know, like, and they might not also see the message requests, uh, you know, so that's also another reason. So I would, I would not recommend Facebook unless they're comfortable with it. So it's, it's your job to find out if they're okay with it or not. Uh, and those are the ways. Uh, and obviously another way is this is where us clinical experience is important because you come here, you meet people, you know, you meet people from different backgrounds. They might know someone you might like actually work with the doctors and they might know a, another doctor. So that's how you actually make contact. You know, those, these are the most common ways. And I guess like people already know about these, but one, my advice, I think a unique perspective would be, don't be afraid to contact people. Uh, people usually help. Okay. Usually they help. So don't be afraid. Uh, just reach out to as many people as you can and someone eventually will help you and, um, you'll get your way. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, I actually had, uh, I mean, one of my professors, he uh, used to say that, you know, like, don't be scared of emails, always send emails. And you <laughs> never know that one email might change your life forever. So who knows, but <laughs> until you, I mean, get out there, you know, you present yourself out there, you send emails. I mean, it's, it's not like uh, you should be, I mean, bombarding people, right? Like you mentioned, <laughs> because there are a lot of busy people out there, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of things going to external things and things like that are there. But uh, if you never try, you never, I mean, no, right? So that's yeah. the philosophy uh, behind all these emails and things like that. So uh, great. I mean, I think that was uh, necessary. Uh, and especially in this present day world where we could communicate with people mm -hmm. um, directly through social media, I think that's a good tool that we can use, but uh, right. not to overdo it, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, uh, don't overdo with anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Life. so uh, let's get into a quick uh, rapid fire session uh, right now. <laughs> Uh, if, if you're ready for it. Okay. So if not medicine, then what? I mean, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> if not neurology, uh, then what? Uh, you mean for me, right? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, like, uh, I, I would say I would probably go into cognitive science. Uh, I, I would go into neuroscience, but maybe not medical field. But I, I think that's that's it for me. Yeah. I, mean, uh, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So artificial intelligence in neurology, your thoughts? Ah, very interesting question. This is like something even like I am really interested in. So we, we already have like AI in uh, many instances like imaging. Okay, there is something we call CT perfusion imaging. Uh, so that's like a, it's, it's a normal CT scan. It's just like a difference is how long we, uh, you know, expose the patients to it. You know, it's just the timing of exposure that's different. But the, the interesting part is it's actually the computer AI that does the mapping and like shows you which areas are like less perfused and which areas have like normal blood flow. So it's, that's where it's used. And obviously another area where it's currently used is um, uh, in fMRIs. Again, these are like MRI based blood flow maps of the brain and they also like indicate activities, the most subtlest, uh, subtlest parts. Um, Lots of places AI has been used, but uh, you know, in our practice, day-to-day -day practice, we see it less commonly. So it's it's mostly limited to research as of now. Uh, we only use it like uh, uh, less. Uh, we don't use it that frequently. It's like mostly handwritten work and uh, you know our own cerebral processing that goes on. But obviously, AI is a is a big part uh, in neurology. Uh, you know, a lot of concepts in AI. Uh, in AI, artificial general intelligence and computer engineering have actually come from neuroscience. And neuroscience, neurology is a field that actually uh, made the field of neuroscience to be possible because we study all the deficits in patients, you know, all the diseases of the brain that manifests as malfunctions in thought processes and the mind too, right? 
And uh, that kind of gave us valuable information about the areas of the brain and what their functions are, the subtle nuances as well as the coarse functions. So that actually did go in um, to process when they were uh, you know, thinking about AI. And one, one thing where I think it's the most per pertinent is machine learning, I would say, because that's a concept. It's to teach machines something. It's, so that's the way how our brains learn too. And, uh, and um, you know, there was also this TED talk I heard. They're also diagnosing hardware problems now based on software malfunctions, you know. So it's, it's the same concepts here in neurology as well. So I guess there's a lot of parallels, I would say. Uh, but it's not like we don't use AI on a day-to-day -day basis, but we use AI. There are like a lot of factions where we use AI for, uh, you know, they directly apply. Uh, I would say, I mean, like I'm talking from my practice, field of practice. Um, but yeah, in imaging, most of the time you can see AI. And obviously right now uh, we are pooling data from many projects. Like one of the most notable ones is human connectome project. So right now we don't have any immediate useful information from that as a neurologist in clinic uh, in our practice, but hopefully in the future, uh, it might like give us more information so we can treat more patients more accurately. So the future is bright, I would say, but right now we're getting there. We're still not there, but we're getting there. In short, I would say that, yeah. So there are a lot of diseases uh, in the field of neurology to take care of, right? So let's say if uh, you know you could cure one disease mm -hmm. <laughs> among the many so which do you think uh, would you cure um uh well i i would say i would say dementia um because that's like it's also kind of personally relevant to me um i have like my grandmother herself is uh, a dementia patient and i was like a i was very close to her and that kind of came up as a shock as well and uh, uh, my personal uh, you know, emotional aspects aside, um, I also find dementia philosophically challenging, not just like medically or biologically. Because it's like, you know, it, it raises important questions like for our existence, like what it means to be, uh, to have an identity or sense of personality and like what it means to lose your memory and how important memories and cognitive processing is in our day-to-day -day life. We can see these when we study dementia patients. And, uh, you know, unfortunately right now for most major type of dementias, we don't have any treatment, the more progressive types. Uh, we just know the variations in their symptoms and the, the type of diseases that they manifest as, but we don't have a cure right now. And it would be great if we could cure in someone with Alzheimer's because, you know, like just think about it. Someone who's just forgotten who, who they are, like they've lost their sense of identity. Like if, if you kind of theoretically speaking, if you give them a medication and they like just start becoming who they were before, like how amazing is that? So that's like that kind of motivates me. And that's what got me into this field initially. And like I said, there's this concept of inflammation theory of uh, uh, neurological diseases. And more and more, we are trying uh, our monoclonal antibodies uh, to treat these degenerative conditions. And uh, we're trying, you know, you know, currently a lot of disease modifying treatments are on trial uh, for dementia. So just a, a month ago, uh, FDA approved a monoclonal antibody. I, I forgot the name because I usually don't use it that often. So they approved a monoclonal antibody to, uh, as a disease modifying agent for Alzheimer's uh, dementia. So they actually target the beta plated sheets, you know, the proteins. So it's, it's still controversial, it's not there, but it's actually a start. So we were just treating dementia symptomatically. Now we're getting into the disease modifying part like what's going on with rheumatoid arthritis, you know. So we, we're getting there and that kind of excites me. So I would say dementia, definitely. Sorry, I took, I went off on a tangent. <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, I, I didn't know that it was, I mean, connected mm -hmm. to you on a personal level as well. So I, I didn't know this fact, you know, I just put in the question and That's I was not okay. expecting that, but that was a very well-rounded answer, a lot of sauce with, because like you said, right? I mean, it's philosophically, I mean, uh, a challenge because I too can't believe, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't imagine what that person might be going through when they, you know, forget mm -hmm. to forget their cognitive, I mean, 
the things that they'd learned, right? You slowly forget it. I mean, that must be pretty frustrating for those patients. So yeah, I, I hope that you, you know, go on to find a cure for dementia as well. I mean, it might not be your ultimate goal for it, but you know, I, I really wish something like that would happen. So uh, before we wrap this, <laughs> exactly. Uh, before we wrap this session up, so this whole USMLE process, you know, I mean, uh, in these, I mean, in this video, you made it sound, uh, I mean, you know, in a simple way, right? I mean, give the steps and just follow your passion and then work on everything and then you'll reach that point, right? But it's actually a really tiresome kind of a process and it takes a toll on a lot of people and there's things like that, right? So how would you say someone, um, you know, would, should, should, I mean, it's, it's not about how someone should, but uh, yeah. how do you think would uh, be uh, one of the best ways to go around or uh, go about this thing, you know, coping with the whole USMLE journey and all these steps, all these procedures. I mean, you just don't, it's not enough to be academically sound, right? You need to, you need to be passionate, you need to be everything. And uh, all of these things actually culminate into who you are, just like you mentioned FIFA, right? I mean, those uh, uh, diagnosed, they need to go everywhere. So how do you cope with all of this? You know, it's totally overwhelming for a lot of people, but uh, you can make it if you persevere enough, right? So what would be a good coping strategy for this whole process and uh, what's it like at the end of the tunnel? You know? Yeah, I think this is, uh, this would probably be the most important question, I would say, you know, out of everything that we talked about, those things like we already know, uh, you know, like most people that, that are like uh, already studying USMLE, they probably have heard everyone talk about what we just did. But then this, this is something that most people we don't talk about, you know, but emotional support, psychological support is the most important thing, I would say, when you're going for, uh, you know, opting for USMLE, especially if you're an international medical graduate, because there are a lot of barriers to overcome. And uh, we know that there are a lot of barriers and uh, uh, especially for an IMG going into a, you know, drastically different environment. It's, it's a great challenge in itself. And uh, if, if you don't have a good support system, it's going to be very hard for you, okay? You've got a lot of things going on. Unfortunately, like not everyone is lucky to have a good support system, so I can understand that. Uh, you know, I myself, I had a great support system. I had like great friends and I had a family. Uh, I wouldn't be here without them. And like I had great mentors as well and people who helped me here in the US, I didn't know them, but then like once I got to know them, they were like very selfless and like their kind of, their kind help uh, made things easier for me. They, they, like just simple things, you know, letting me stay at their place, you know, just crash for like one or two days. It, it helps you a lot because um, it's emotionally taxing as well. There's a lot of psychological toll if you're opting for this journey and not to mention there's also like you know um, you know not to go without mentioning financial stress too all right it's 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 a huge strain on your budget uh because and, and the thing is there's like it's there's no you know fixed amount that you can even plan you know a lot of things like so many unplanned things can happen you know in in the way and you need to factor on in all those things and they can like strain you financially and also emotionally it's it's like a huge huge uh, commitment. That's why I'm saying, so psych you need your family's support, most important. If you have friends that are supportive and helpful, uh, you, uh, you know, that's a plus. Uh, if you have a spouse uh, who, you know, even if they're not like going for a USMLE, but they're like eager to move with you, that's like a huge benefit. And if you have a spouse who is also going into this field, it's going to get even easier. Uh, even easier if you go into the same same place or, you know, luckily you match in the same place. Um, you know, that's like a dream come true for most couples, I would say. And uh, psychological support, uh, you, you desperately need this. This is like the most important thing. I cannot stress enough on this part. And uh, um, yes, obviously strategy, uh, your smarts, everything matters. We know about that. Uh, I would also say if you don't have a good psychological support, uh, you're, you know, you, it might not come into your scores um, too. And all of these things are like interrelated and they, they you know, affect other aspects, other dimensions too. Um, the next thing I think uh, 
uh, is interview skills too. Uh, I, you don't have to be discouraged if you're not good at like interviews and you know, most of us aren't, you know, everyone practices. So you need to practice. And I think uh, uh, psychological support also uh, plays a huge part when you're practicing for your interviews, um, giving you confidence, you know, okay, if I, if I don't match, I have like a safety net. I can go back home, relax. My parents will let me apply again, or, you know, they will give me some support or other options. So if, if you have that safety net, then you can also do, uh, do well in the interviews, right? So these are all like, I would say just like have a holistic approach when you're going into USMLE. So it's not like just USMLE exams and like match. It's not that black and white. It's, it's very nuanced. You need to consider the subtleties as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Sashwat, for that. And I think that was most necessary because, like you said, you know, uh, coming from another country, going into another country for practice, everything is there. So, yeah, I think this was a productive session today. And I got to learn a lot of things as well, you know, because uh, I didn't know much about neurology. Uh, I'm interested in the brain, but to become a neurologist, you know, maybe that's a different side of the story. But it's quite interesting. I mean, uh, I, I actually realized a lot of aspects of this specialty, which I never knew before. And, yeah. That, that was really nice having you here today. So uh, anything you'd like to add uh, as a closing remark and then we could wrap this session up. Um, um, I think you covered most of the process. Uh, I would say like, you know, uh, the only advice I would give is like, don't get discouraged. Uh, if this is like where you want to come, um, then like, you know, you should like, uh, and you can give effort. You definitely should is my advice. And uh, uh, you know, they do compensate uh, physicians fairly uh, in the U.S. and uh, you won't regret it w once you match. Obviously, it's going to get busy and you'll get through that, but it's part of the process. Uh, but, you know, you'll be happy as a physician, I would say, uh, here in the U.S. I mean, at least that's my experience, uh, if it's not true for everyone. And obviously, Anurag, like, if you let me talk, then I, I talk a lot. You know, <laughs> I love talking. So I wouldn't end. So I would say that's, that's my main advice. And I would say psychological support and a holistic approach and a focused approach towards your application. So those remain my take home message. I would say people should take home. So, yeah. Thank you so much Dr. Sastros for taking out the time to be here today and, uh, you know, tell us about what neurology is like. And I think you're a very good representation of what uh, neurology is and, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, hopefully so. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things to look up to. And like you mentioned, right, some things come naturally and some things come with practice. And maybe that's why this field of medicine, right, we have a medical practice because you just keep on practicing and you get better every day, right? So, yeah. okay, uh, that was really nice. And it was really nice having you here. So, uh, yeah, if you have any questions for Dr. Sastra, then please leave them down in the comments below. I will be leaving, I mean, I have been in this video leaving links to how you can connect with him. I, in short, I mean, uh, gifts, and I'll also leave the links down in the description how you can contact him. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, shoot them in the comments and I will be able to convey them to Dr. Sashrat and maybe we can do a follow-up video as well. So thanks a lot, Dr. Sashrat, for being here. So yeah, yeah thanks Thank a lot. You. <laughs> Thank you Anurag, for having me. Um, it was a pleasure getting to you know be a part of your YouTube venture. And I also wish you all the best in your own journey. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I hope the uh, video, the channel grows uh, like you want it to. And I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll have subscribed and I'll follow you uh, closely as well. Thank you. That, thank that, you so that, that's really great. I mean, that was really nice of you to have uh, added that. So thank you so much. So yeah. yeah. So with that, this is Dr. Sashwat Singh Pokhrel and Dr. Anurag signing off with a promise to meet you yet again in another video, probably. And until then, you stay happy, stay positive, And as always... Stay strong.